And that means we are live here on YouTube, Tackle Trading's daily market routine, halftime report. Uh, I got Coach Matt, Coach Cody, and myself, Coach Tim. Matt, how are you doing today? You know, Tim, doing really good. Excited to be here with the crew and uh, looking forward to uh, another halftime report. We've got a lot to talk about today. Yeah, there is quite a bit uh, to go through. Number one, I'm looking at the heat map, Matt, and it's a mixed market. We've got strength in some areas, weakness in others. Energy's a little bit down. You know, Exxon, Chevron, there's some news there. Uh, first off, though, just the S&P 500 itself. What's your read on this hesitation day? We're literally flat, 0.02%. Uh, what's your read on the market here up at the top? Well, just uh, a big day t- yesterday on the breakout of the high base. You're approaching the all-time high and you have a rash of uh, earnings reports that came out today, uh, obviously led a lot by Texas Instruments and Boeing and uh, Caterpillar. A lot of those industrial components came out. A little bit of mixed action there uh, from an earnings perspective. I, I, I didn't see a lot that was absolutely just juggernauts out there, Tim. Uh, Texas came in okay. Boeing came in okay. We'll look at those stocks here in just a minute. Um, but, uh, you know, I just didn't see a lot of just overwhelmingly positive or overwhelmingly negative uh, type of earnings reports. And, and quite frankly, when you're, when you're, yes, Boeing in Texas is big and big and big, but when you're looking down the barrel and you're, you're faced with Microsoft, Facebook, Verizon, PayPal, Tesla, Chipotle, all reporting tonight, I mean, I just think it's the a little bit of pause after yesterday's big price boom coming into the all-time highs. Yeah, obviously earnings. We're going to start with Texas Instruments, in my opinion, uh, one of the most important companies that reported. We talked about that yesterday. TXN now pressing a high. Uh, you know, they they actually came out and said that they had some slowing demand for their product. Their CEO was a little bit cautious, but the market really shrugged this one off, Matt. Breaking now above that pivot point. You've got some old history back uh, last year, July and August, up around these levels as well, but we're literally pushing into a high, Matt. Uh, what you read on TXN? Uh, TXN's uh, earnings report came in at 1.22 on earnings per share versus the expectation of 1.13. So a good beat on earnings per share. Revenue came in at 3.6 billion versus the expectation of 3.5 billion. Uh, so a slight beat on 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 revenue as well. Guidance came in. I I want to say flat. I would say. Uh, so the beat on earnings per share and the slight beat on revenue with guidance coming in somewhat flat. Uh, obviously a little bit of a positive reaction. Not necessarily positive enough to break the all time high here at uh, 120.75, but you do have some positive uh, positive uh, movement here in Texas Instruments, and it does pique my interest here a little bit, Tim, when you have a, a, a situation where you're looking at this three-year weekly, cha- excuse me, this last, you know, three-year weekly, but really just looking at the last year and seeing a lot of range of neutrality with the perhaps of breaking out of that all-time high on, on the backs of a positive report, you look at this daily chart here, obviously you're, you're attempting to break out of that high base. You're attempting to break out of this old resistance level right here. But I do believe a trigger above 120 is absolutely tradable here. Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, many other companies have an earnings, you know, yesterday and today before the bell, and we've got a bunch we're going to prep. By the way, later in the show, and Matt, you've already done a lot of work uh, prepping that Tesla trade, and I was looking at a lot of the data as we were getting ready. It's going to be exciting. We're going to prep that earnings play and kind of talk about volatility projections and whatnot. Another company that grabbed my eye, Matt, was eBay. Now, you know, obviously eBay is no Amazon. You know, I don't think I'm talking out of school there. It's a $30 billion company instead of a $900 billion company. But they had some good numbers. Numbers came out pretty strong. They're now pressing into a high. Breakout there would be impressive, in my opinion. Now, you've got an earnings gap here. uh, So it's not the same for confirmation, Matt. But what was your reaction to eBay gapping out? Uh, eBay's earnings report came in at 67 cents a share versus 63 cents a share. Revenue came in line at 2.6 billion a piece. Revenue grew at 2.4 percent year over year. Uh, on the guidance, I'm reading it right now. Tim, guidance came in. I, I would say guidance came in slightly up. I would say on eBay. So growth rates, earnings per share, all fairly good on eBay. A positive res- response to I would say a lukewarm earnings report, but a lukewarm earnings report is certainly better than a really, really bad earnings report. So a slight positive earnings report, good positive movement on the price action, coming smack dab right here into the old level of resistance right here at about 38.50. Uh, positive reaction, I, 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 when I'm looking at eBay here potentially versus a Texas, I do like Texas above 120 more than I like eBay above 38.50. You know, we'll get to Boeing and some of the blue chips when we go on to the Dow, but I want to stay with the S&P 500 companies for a minute here, Matt. Uh, Antum really, really is a pattern that I'm loving here. And healthcare, we're going to get to A&TM. Uh, obviously, healthcare, uh, yep, no, no. Oh. I think you might have added an I in there. 
Yeah, I was going to say, let's go short that 30 cent stock. That's a low base <laughs> uh, type situation. A- What's Anthony? A N T M. A N T M. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Look at the bear retracement. Earnings before the bell here today. Uh, $64 billion company coming back into old support, new resistance, Matt. The obviously, we like bearish retracements. The market's been healthy and strong, but healthcare is not. Uh, we've had sector rotation the last week or so where the healthcare companies spun out. Now, this is a technical catalyst zone, but you have no confirmation yet. What's your read on that chart? Uh, it's, it's what I'm seeing a lot in the healthcare space, and it's something we've talked about in the last week, Tim, about how healthcare was overextended to the downside. And, you know, the most likely scenario was we're going to see a little bit of a snapback bearish retracement or, or a low base type situation. And if, if you're looking to short that type of situation, for me, I would love retracements coming back up into those uh, old uh, support channels, which will act as new uh, resistance channels. So when you look at the healthcare space in general, and let's look at XLV here, you see the breakdown of support right here at about 89, sets that lower, uh, lower low right here at about 85, 85.50. You see the slowing momentum candles here. You see that big upward movement in price that we had yesterday. You see the slowing down here. So you have a bearish trend. You then have a snapback bearish retracement coming back up in to a little bit of resistance. So the question is, how are you going to play that is, is really the overriding question here. And when I'm looking at perhaps trading this now, if I come back over here and let's go to the tackle trading website real quick. And let's uh, go to the reports. I'll show you uh, something we talked about a little bit in, in the uh, coaches show yesterday. Just give me one second. So if I come down here in the newsletter, Tim, and I come all the way down to the bottom and I see all these different sectors here, the broad market sectors, and I click on the healthcare sector, that's going to pull up a whole bunch of stocks right here, Tim, that I can take a look at very quickly to kind of find all those ones mm -hmm. in this space that I can perhaps look at uh, perhaps shorts. And you got, you know, just making a quick list here, Tim, you know, you got Abbott Labs, you know, a company I like, but as a trader, you got to trade the trend. Good reversal up here. Good snap back, kiss of death uh, pattern right here. Let's go look at that one. Eli Lilly, little shallow retracement there. I'd look at that as a flag more than anything else. Uh, looking at uh, Amgen coming. Look, look at that one on Amgen, Tim. Amgen. Yeah. Old support. You see that all this horizontal support here coming back up into there. We'll take a look at that one. When you're looking at uh, Gilead Sciences, nice bearish trend. Good little snap back rally. Looking at, uh, let's see, oh, Cigna, CI. That's a mm -hmm. company we've had on the short list before. And so you just kind of get a, a, a fill for certain things that you look at perhaps from a bearish perspective. Veritex, VRTX as well. Look at Baxter here. Nice little bearish retracement coming back in. Regeneron. A lot of the pharmaceuticals uh, I'm, I'm noticing as I, as I go through this, Tim, a lot of those pharmaceutical companies are really kind of coming into those same type of patterns, those bearish retracements. And if they can't get back up above those resistance levels, you should have some pretty good shorting opportunity out there. And so when we're looking at this just from a couple price perspectives, Abbott Labs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Reversal pattern, M, breakdown out of the M, the 20-day moving average crossing over the 50-day moving average, retracement coming back into that breakout channel, coming smack dab into now decreasing moving averages. You haven't triggered yet on Abbott Labs here, but you see, and we'll just kind of zone in here, you see how it's coming up, big up, big up. Okay, nice little big down, slowing momentum candle, upward movement in price with confirmation. But look at what the candle's doing now. It's getting a little slower. It's still up. We still have momentum to the upside, so I'm not looking to short it here. But watch this over the next couple of days. Watch Abbott Labs. If it cannot reclaim those moving averages, Tim, that's very, very important. Because if it cannot reclaim those moving averages, we should see Abbott slowly turn over and then maybe confirm coming back down underneath 76. That's a good little shorting opportunity in the short term if we do get confirmation. You look at Amgen here. Look at all this neutrality. Boom, 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 boom. Look at all this support level right there. And the only problem with this one is smack dab right there, 5-1, 430. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. But that's that kind of that little shallow retracement coming back up into those support channels that create a new resistance channel. Now Amgen has their earnings. So that's kind of throwing that one out the window, but you can see the setup that you're kind of looking for. Same thing here on, on Cigna. Earnings coming up on 5-2, you might have enough time if we do get confirmation, but these are the things you're type of looking for is these retracements coming back up into these now downward moving averages, old support right here at 160. Maybe that acts as a role as resistance as well. Probably stay away because of the earnings, but again, just kind of showing you the technical setups that you're that you're looking for. Same thing with Veritex. That's a real good trigger right there on Veritex just as earnings too tight. CNC is another one post earnings here on CNC, Tim. Uh, you have a snapback rally coming back up into the old support channel at 50. You got a slowing momentum right under 50. And in my opinion, a real good trigger right underneath 50 on, on CNC. So that's a potential one you could look at. The one I'm looking at here, Tim, is United Health. And it's something we've talked about a lot in, in, in everything we do. But when you're looking at this post earnings reaction and then the shallow movement back up into those support channels over here, now new resistance levels at that 230 by 232 level. We talked about this as the moving averages come down, watch this little puppy roll back over $200 should not be, it should not be, you know, a crazy thought for uh, United Health over the next week or a uh, week or two. So that's a potential out there. And that's what I've been talking about in terms of selling into strength and, buy, and excuse me, selling into weakness and buying into strength. You want to find these trends and I'm going to trade the trends until the trends change. But this is giving you a pretty good little setup with a good little stop loss right above that 232, 233 level. Yeah. One more stock in the healthcare sector I want you to look at is a little different pattern though, is uh, Biogen. One of the biggest biotech companies in the world. And obviously they came in and had their earnings this morning, Matt. Uh, muted reaction here. They're actually got a red candle down almost 2%. Exactly. Not Biogen. One of the biggest sell off, but you know, what I'm seeing here on Biogen is that you got a little base pattern now developing. You know, you're 10 points from the low point, but you got a pivot right there at 220. Uh, you're now post earnings. If you have weakness in biotech and healthcare, this one could also sell off as well. Absolutely. The only the only question is, you know, trigger, right? You have yeah. this old support down here at 216. You have a short term support here at 226. Probably wouldn't do anything in between those levels. I see that really more as neutrality. If you're looking to play Biogen, in my opinion, you got to wait for the break. Uh, you got to wait for that type to, to to really kind of break down. Look at this weekly chart. I mean, there's just so much weakness, and obviously, a lot of this price movement was the failed. Uh, drug Biogen had from last month, or, or not felt drug, but phase three trials, the mm -hmm. felt drug. So, uh, so a lot of momentum to the downside, slowing momentum down here. What I what I like to see here is just another break. Wait for the break. You got a good target at 200. And if it breaks 200, it's clear selling to the downside. You know, we're talking a lot of earnings here today. We're in the middle of earnings season and we've got a lot of companies reporting. Other companies on the S&P, Matt, today, Caterpillar came out, had their earnings. They actually gapped into a middle of a range now, uh, down 2.5%. Not a lot to see there. Not exactly a massive sell-off. Under selling on the gap, by the way, their volatility projection was a little higher than that. So the market makers, it's not too nasty of a gap. Any read on that chart on CAT? Oh, on Caterpillar? Mm -hmm. Oh, not not a lot on the gap. I'm not looking to do anything here, but just to kind of give you some numbers. I believe I got the numbers on CAT. Uh, 295, uh, 294 earnings per share versus 284 earnings per share. So a beat on earnings per share. Uh, revenue 13.5 versus 13.4. Guidance was not stated, or at least not that I saw. Um, so, you know, just a, a muted response, in my opinion, to an earnings report. Gaps down into a support channel. There, I, it's real cloudy here. Mm -hmm. it's, I, I don't see a, a very clear picture here. I don't see something that is triggerable. You know, maybe it's played above 140, but then, you, I mean, you got 141, 141, 75 kind of staring at you. So I, I, I just don't see anything really to trade here on the gap. It's, it's, it's cloudy in my opinion. Yeah, a little bit cloudy. I'll tell you another one that's very cloudy as well is Northrop Grumman, a uh, major diversified company. Obviously, they do a lot in defense. That, and what's have, their uh, and so, the knock list? My favorite symbol right now. Oh, the knock list. <laughs> the knock list. I can't yeah. believe I forgot the knock list. Yeah, uh, Ethan Hunt, baby. It's the knock list. That's right. For Down those for of you who like uh, <laughs> Mission Impossible. Uh, MI one was great. MI two was great. MI three was great. They're great movies, right? Mindless. I, I was gonna. I was waiting for you to say if one nope. of them bad. Nope, they're all great. I, I they're like all them. Great. They're yeah, all. They're, 
Well done movies. Uh, NLC down here today, 4%, Matt. That's not a great candlestick. Uh, I'll tell you, it looked like yeah. it was opening where it was going to hold that gap from yesterday, but now we're selling off. Man, I'll tell you, not a good, not a good candle. If you break below that pivot, that could come all the way back down to the low. Yeah, it could come back down to 260, five by 270. Uh, the candle's ugly. You're not looking to touch this. And, and, and honestly speaking, I mean, you're not looking to short this either. I mean, it, it's obviously really, really nasty candle, but you got so much activity down here. Mm-hmm. So much activity. When you're looking at a, a lot of these, you know, take UNH, for example. I'd much rather take you an age than the knock. There's just too much, too much support, too much crazy, too much noise underneath knock on the support level. And it's then the clear big, air. We like the, clear air on breakdowns. We sure do. I'll tell you what is having some clear air here today's ROL. Biggest loser on the S&P 500 here today. They missed earnings, estimates, and guidance. They were in a beautiful uptrend, Matt. But this is why you have to check earnings, guys. Uh, yeah. Slight miss. I I didn't see their numbers. Um, Slight miss on the earnings. Doesn't matter what the numbers are. The market hated it. Market absolutely hated it. it. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty. Stay away. Uh, away. Companies on the upside here. Fleur is breaking out and showing strength. F L I R up eight percent. T E L is breaking out and and showing strength. The railroad. Fleur looks great. Yeah, Yeah. that's good. That's that's even a lot of momentum behind that. Watch how that performs. Uh, If it can get above fifty five, watch how that performs. Look at Norfolk Southern, NSC, Matt. Railroad companies and transports have been running hot this spring, and obviously they've been in, in real good uptrends. NSC now breaking into a new high as well. Yeah, that's a good gap, good run. Railroads have been strong all year long. And you know it's a, it's a strong market when even the evil empire can break to a new high. Uh, look at Moody's, MCO. Oh, I thought you were going to say. I thought you were going to say. We uh, could debate Goldman that Sachs. one. I mean, uh, MC, MC, uh, MCO. Mm-hmm. a strong chart mco is the evil empire i'm just gonna confirm that <laughs> mco is the evil empire <laughs> goldman sachs is the evil empire come on if if you had to pick one publicly traded company to represent the 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 empire in star wars it would have to be goldman sachs of course but moody's would be the uh, uh they're all right they would they're, 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 they're who's the race that like they would be a propaganda fire. firm they would be a propaganda firm for <laughs> goldman sachs that's yeah. what moody's uh, <laughs> talking about how great the empire is yeah, yeah uh, i could see that i could see that i'm seeing some interesting good break though and, 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 and like like coach mark likes to say guys i like investing in evil companies because they know how to make money it, it is true i don't invest in evil companies i'll Either trade them. I. I will trade them. I will tell you that I trade all kinds of companies because that's buying and selling. Well, trading is different from investing, though. I'll trade yeah. Goldman Sachs. I won't invest in Goldman Sachs. I'll, I'll trade Moody's. You got to love the breakout on Moody's. I mean, let's let's look at this a little more in depth here. Good bullish uptrend here. Very solid bullish uptrend. Earnings report. I did not look at the numbers, but just from an earnings per share perspective, 207 versus 194. Good beat on earnings per share. I'm pretty sure the revenue came in in line or maybe a slight beat on that as well. But you got to look at this price movement here. And and <clears throat> it's not just this candle here. It's this overall consistency of this trend right here. And then when you're breaking out of that resistance level, showing strength on good uh, on, on good volume so far, that will pick up as, as we pick up steam. You got to in, in terms of the trend, in terms of the pattern, in terms of the break, in terms of the beat on earnings. I, I mean, what else do you need? By the way, uh, Franco in the. Tanko is in the chat here. Franco, it's great to see you, young man. Franco, what's he, up, buddy? He says over CMG. Uh, CMG is not the evil empire. They're just an no. overvalued. Uh, They're burrito. just an overvalued burrito company. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. By the way, Franco, I'm going to be down in Houston. They uh, might be evil for cool. all of our health, though. Yeah. Well, I don't know. A lot of people think they have uh, good products. I mean, really? I yeah. ate there for the first time. Um, I was down in uh, San Diego with my wife. <laughs> That was a pretty uh, a funny tweet, by the way. Yeah, thank you for that. And I said, for the first time, I tweeted out, uh, I'm, I, I'm testing it. I'm doing it. I'm diving in. I'm getting CMG. Yeah. And I ate it. And what is everybody thinking? My God, it, it, I don't understand it. I, I really do don't. It, it's not. It, listen, there are it, Cafe Rio in Salt Lake City is a local place. It's 10 times better than Chipotle. It, it, no, I mean, it, it's not good. It's a filthy burrito and it's not even that good. I don't understand it. I really don't. 
Yeah. I mean, I know, listen, I'm gonna, I, get, I know I'm gonna offend a lot of people who love Chipotle. <laughs> my I, favorite burrito there is. Listen, I, I will tell you downtown. I so. will tell you, I am looking forward to CMG's earnings report tonight a ton. When you're looking at CMG's, and, and I'll just give you some numbers very quickly, Tim. CMG has a market maker move of 47.2. Okay, it was 47.2 last night, 47.57. Now, when you're when you're trading earnings, <clears throat> when you're trading earnings, it's all about understanding gaps and gap ranges, right? And with, with the market maker move at 47.2 points, that represents a 6.7% average market maker move gap. And so the market expects 47 points, which re- represents 6.7% on the gap. When you look at CMG's average gap over the last four earnings, so this earning here, this earnings here, this earnings here, and this earnings here right there, you got a 52 point price movement, <clears throat> which represented 10%. You got a 10% 10 point price movement, which represented 4%. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. You got a 25 point uh, price movement, which represents 5.5%. And you had a 50 point price point movement, which represents 4 point, 14.7%. The average gap is 8.5%. Okay. Now, out of the last four earnings reports, two of them have exceeded the 6.7% expected move. Two of them have not exceeded the 2.6% expected move. So you really don't have an edge on the expected move, but you do have an edge on the average gap because when Chipotle runs, Chipotle wants to run. And it, and it will run fast one way or the other. And it is a beautiful, beautiful chart. And Franco, you are absolutely right. Wall Street has loved those burritos far more than I do. Far more than I do, and from a trader's perspective, you got to love that. So the average gap range, I, I'm I'm just not sure you have a significant enough edge to to trade that. But if you did, I would say you trade the volatility. You expect it to move more than what the market expects. You know, uh, I have to point out what Jonathan just said here in the chat. Somebody else said it earlier as well. I think Marcelo, uh, Matt, in San Diego, you're literally like a stone's throw from Mexico. You probably have great burrito shops and Mexican food down there. And you went to Chipotle. All right. That's okay. Called- Jonathan's right. I, I, and I will hit up Jonathan next time I'm in San Diego. Um, Jonathan's 100% accurate on that. Um, but I, it was like, that's like going to New York city and getting listen, pizza at Sabar. I had just got into the plane. My wife had sent me around. She's on this new, it must be just a California thing because she had me go get all this celery to make her celery juice in the morning and not one stinking grocery store had celery. They were all sold out. So I had to go around everywhere. And finally I saw a CMG and I'm like, the wife's begging for some food. It's right there. Let's test it. (laughs) That was the entire philosophy. I get it. Nothing wrong with it. I'm glad you had had a great time. Oh, Tijuana with some food. I've never been to Tijuana. I've been to Mexico many times. Oh, uh, you want you want to talk about Tijuana? Talk about the one time Bo Moody put in uh, the Tijuana Southern Border address into my Uber app instead of taking it <laughs> taking me to my wife. It was taking me to the southern border. I'm not kidding. That's I was I was literally like two minutes from the southern border, and the Uber driver's like, "Uh, what do you want to do?" And I'm like, "What do you mean? I do, take me take me to the location? Like, you want to go to Tijuana?" I'm like. No, I don't want to go to Tijuana. <laughs> oh, my. oh my! I heard uh, back before Uber and everything that the taxi rides uh, they would take you from like San Diego to Tijuana for like pennies on the dollar, and then they would just wait until you know after you're done having your shenanigans, you need to get back, and then they like hyper inflate the price to get home. <laughs> shenanigans shenanigans i'll tell you i'll tell you what else is shenanigans is apc right now bring up uh, the apc chart good comeback on that good i'll tell you on that they had a deal with chevron matt uh they got outbid you know uh they got outbid uh by i believe occidental petroleum ox 20 percent upward 20 percent uh what was it 20 percent on top yeah of what their bid was yeah, OXY came out and said, listen, Chevron, you've got a lot of money, no doubt about it, but we're willing to pay premium for APC. And they upped the offer by 20%. Uh, you've got a lot of gapping in here. There's no trade here. Uh, <laughs> no, there is, but the investors of Anadarko are just like, oh, please bid war, bid war. Everybody just keep bidding. Everybody bid. Wow. Correct. 
pretty pretty incredible actually on that gap. Uh, take a peek at Chevron though, by the way, CVX. Interesting to watch this chart because energy actually showed some weakness here today. Now you've got earnings coming up. The big two, Matt, Exxon and Chevron are on Friday. Friday, fun day. It's going to be an oil day, I'm sure about it. Well, I guarantee uh, so it'll be an oil day. You're breaking down. That would be a tradable trigger if it was not for that earnings on Friday. But two to watch uh, on Friday coming up, I'm sure. That, that is why as a trader, I still support two earnings per year instead of four. I would love it if they would move to it. But I, I like all the volatility too. If you know how to trade Vega, you know, I mean, listen, we're prepping inverted flies and straddles and strangles and all kinds of stuff. I, I get it. I, I do think it would be better economically to have two per year. Uh, but I guess you got to just adapt. Well, you, you want to be forthright and you want to be open with your earnings. And we all we all know some of the some of the horror stories with Enron and Tyco. And so I get it. But, you know, it just seems like overkill these days. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Move on to the Dow Jones Industrial Average, if you would, the DIA or the YM contract, either one. Fading, 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 mixed across the Dow. Uh, first off, not much on the overall index here, Matt. Kind of a, a doji day. Say again, T, I'd take my headset off. I think I'm oh. coming down with a cold. Oh, no problem. Uh, I say mixed on the index here, just kind of a doji day on the broad index. So you're going to have to break down the individual components. Nothing really here on this chart from yesterday. It's fading. It's fading, fading a little up, a little down, just fading. As you're approaching those all-time highs, we're seeing it both in the S&P and, and the Dow Jones. We'll get to some strength here in a minute, but we got to start with Boeing. Boeing had earnings, obviously, and it's one of the biggest components. Boeing's one of our favorite companies long-term. We were, we're obsessed with Boeing. We love the company. <laughs> But they've been in the news recently. They've been stuck in the mud, Matt. Today is no more clarity, you know. I, I can't remember who said it in the halftime report yesterday. Uh, we were talking about Boeing's expectation. I was talking about how, you know, I, did, I didn't think there was a lot of price movement. I didn't think there was any trades there. But I want to give a shout out to whoever said it. And I can't remember, so I apologize for whoever said this. Uh, but they said Boeing's not going to do anything on their earnings. And that's exactly what happened. So whoever called that prediction, nice job. Uh, Boeing literally did absolutely nothing. I know it's up 1% on the day so far today, uh, but Boeing's just got so much overhead that you got to be a little bit concerned about. Uh, earnings per shares came in okay, 3.16 versus the expectation of 3.11. Revenue came in slightly under at 22.9 versus the 23.2. But the interesting thing for, for me here was they suspended guidance, Tim. And the reason they suspended guidance was obviously due to the problems with the uh, 737 Supermax and the deliveries. And I, I, I honestly, I think it's going to hurt them more than they wanted to admit. And, and that, to me, is concerning. I'm, I, I, and I've said this before, guys, in the halftime report, but I do not believe Boeing has been as transparent in this as they should have been. And I'm not just talking now over the last two months, Tim, since the March uh, disaster we saw I'm talking since that Lion jet went down in Indonesia with that first uh, scenario, and then obviously the one that happened in in Africa. But I, I don't, I don't, I just don't like that they haven't been transparent. And I saw that c continue today when they suspended guidance. And I don't have any information on this, guys. But it just, it just, it rubs me the wrong way when when I know Boeing knows that they're they're losing more money than they're letting on and that's why they're this, they're suspending guidance and it's in the it's in the the face of you know well we just don't know we don't know how big of a damage is we don't know how how, how big of the delays in the orders are going to be and I'm just like yes you do you have more information you just don't want to put it out from a public perspective because you know it's going to be a lot more damning than 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 what what the public currently recognizes and so I, I just I just I, I love the company I still love the company it would take a lot for me not to love the company but I, I am a little upset with just the lack of transparency, in my opinion. Yeah, they've got a long way to come uh, to build public trust back. There's no doubt about it. Uh, earnings muted, muted response, stuck in the middle. There's nothing really going to, nothing see, to see here. Nothing to see here. Nothing to see here. But you've got a couple of companies tonight reporting earning, earnings. Visa and Microsoft both are due with earnings tonight after the bell, Matt. Visa, obviously major credit card company, if not the biggest, AXP and those two, uh, they're right up there. Uh, AXP had good numbers. You know, I expect Visa probably will, but you never know with earnings. Then Microsoft has earnings tonight as well. Tomorrow before the bell. It, it, it is so amazing to me, Tim, that as traders, and you, you see this every day in the news, and everybody talks about Facebook and Apple and Amazon and 
you know, all these other earnings report about how they could be such a big catalyst. And they failed to remember the $950 billion behemoth that is Microsoft. I, I mean, it's, it's, one, it's one of the top three companies in the, literally in the entire world. This is going to be a very, very important earnings report tonight. Yeah, I think so as well. Uh, you know, Microsoft has quietly just been a juggernaut for so long. I think you're right, Matt. Low PE ratio, good revenue, good earnings, good leadership, great company. I keep saying it over and over again. It's like it's just it's like it's an old married couple, and they just kind of get into the flow. They yeah. just you know they can finish each other's sentences. They they can read each other's minds, and you know they just kind of go with the flow. And people kind of move on sometimes to the shiny new object of Amazon. Microsoft is an amazing, amazing company. It's one of the biggest companies in the world for a reason. It's up there with the Apples and the Amazon and the Googles, the, the, the juggernauts of the, of, the, of the marketplace. This is one to keep your eye on. This can be a catalyst for the market to break out uh, or for the market to kind of fade back down into support. Yeah. Cisco continues its juggernaut run to the upside up just a hair today. Home Depot's looking good. Most of the Dow components Love are looking Cisco. fine. Cisco's just been a, a beast. Love Cisco. And by the way, Disney might be a growth company now. Look at the dang stock. <laughs> it doesn't want to slow I, I don't understand. I, don't get me wrong. I love it. Don't get me wrong. I, I, I love it. it. It's fantastic. I love this company too. Um, sometimes I like to make fun of companies, but I, I love Disney. Uh, and wow. I, Any I, risk on the Marvel movie this weekend? No. Are you kidding no. me? They're going to set records. They're going to set records, Tim. I'm not, I listen, my family's a Marvel family and they already have record sales, but my family is also one of the families is like, I don't want to go to a crowd of a hundred people. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to wait for, for, to get those nice seats on, on Monday, two o'clock in the afternoon when nobody's there and I'm going to enjoy it. Tim, I know you don't get into the, the, the Marvel movies like, like others do, but I'm, I'm going to enjoy this one. They're fine. I'll watch it later. I don't have to see it on the first weekend. I don't need to fight the crowds. Um, plus, I'm going to be traveling anyway. So I'll miss it this weekend. I'll catch it another time. It's no yep. big deal. Whatever. All right. Moving on to the NASDAQ 100, if you can, NQ contract. NASDAQ has been the strongest. Matt, down here here today, uh, obviously, just a little red doji, you know, up at the top. But we've had a huge upward movement. In the last couple of months, Matt, we've not had two red candles in a, in, in a row since about mid March, we've had almost a month stretch here. Uh, what you read on the NASDAQ? What, what do you want? <laughs> you just momentum, momentum, momentum. And now it's fading on a day that it's not real, not a lot of activity in the market. There's, there's nothing that I'm, you know, taking off my bias here. I mean, I'm not going to call for the market to come right back down into support. I would love it if it did. I mean, reset some of those bearish retracements and whatnot. Uh, But this is a lot of momentum. Yesterday's candle confirmed that momentum. Maybe you fade a little bit, uh, but, uh, you know, NASDAQ top, uh, top index and top index for a reason. You know, Facebook, Microsoft, Tesla, PayPal, uh, LAM Research. There's a bunch of companies that have earnings after the bell here today, Matt. Probably Facebook is just as important as Microsoft, uh, you know, likely to to make a move one way or the other. I know that you'd price some of the volatility numbers on Facebook. Yeah, we we, uh, actually in the coaches show last night, um, obviously we don't go into the detail of, of you know, in, in the halftime report, because we're doing our daily routine, but we, me and uh, coach Gino, and, and by the way, uh, for those of you who were in the uh, coaches show with me and Gino last night, how good was it to have Gino back? Like, seriously, his, his energy, Tim is contagious. And it, it's just, you know, he had three months where he just, you know, had a little bit of a sabbatical, but uh, you know, Gino's uh, back and he was on fire last night, prepping Debacons on, on Facebook. And I was showing the uh, the not the antithesis of the Devacon, but a little bit more of a theta based type uh, situation. And that was with uh, an inverted butterfly. Uh, but it, to us, I mean, you talk about an edge. I mean, and again, not going to go into the detail, but I'm just going to give you the numbers here. The market maker expectation is 10.2, which represents a 5.5 percent price movement on the on the market maker move, Tim. In the last four gaps, Facebook has gapped 14 points, 10 points, 40 points, and 14 points, which represents 9.5%, 6.6%, 18%, and 8.1% on the respective gap range. Every gap range of the last four has exceeded the gap range that is expected uh, tonight. 
-hmm. And so, and so you have the average gap range of 10.5% which versus the expectation of 5.5%. The average price movement on the gap is 10.2 uh, points versus the average over the last four earnings reports at 19.5. So you have a very good edge here on, on volatility, Tim. And so basically what, what our analysis last night was, it was just how do you play it? Do you play it in the Debicon or do you play it with the inverted, uh, inverted butterfly? The more conservative is obviously the fly. And, and that's, that's probably what I'm going to be doing tonight on it. Yeah, that replay, I got to tell you, I watched it this morning and uh, you guys were on fire. So if you're a pro member and you have not caught the replay yet, may, it is must watch at some point here today and, and really dig into the energy of Gino and Matt talking about earnings and prep and earnings. Uh, those shows, man, we have a lot more opportunity to dive deeper into content like that. Uh, obviously, we're working through well, our stuff right now. What, what we're going to be doing, because we used to, like the, the coaches show, for example, we're, I don't want to say we're, re well, we're not rebranding it, but I, I do want to say we're retooling it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the coaches show was was for the one of the reasons why we started the coaches show was to do market analysis with the team on a weekly basis, right? Mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that the team understood what was going on in the market, to talk about strategy, talk about you know system, when to when to protect retirement accounts, you know, just to make sure the whole team was completely up to speed on everything that's happening in the market. But we do that every day now in the halftime report. Like yep. literally, we do that every day in the halftime report. So we're retooling the coaches show to be more from a, we're going to deep dive into strategies. And and uh, that's kind of what we started doing last night where, you know, Gino being back for his first time, I kind of let him just fly for the first 20, 25 minutes, kind of about how he handles the scouting reports. But then in that next 40 minutes, we really did that deep dive on on the Debacon versus the inverted fly. And and I, I, I loved it. I loved it. And, and I'll tell you right now, Tim, I don't like, Debacons, they're not my they're not my flavor, but I like the inverted fly better. Mm -hmm. But I will tell you, even though I'm still going to do the inverted fly on uh, Facebook tonight, Gino almost got me convinced on the Debacon. Debacons are nice because yeah, the, cost got me convinced. the reward risk is nice. I mean, it's just different expectations on probability, reward, and risk. Uh, they're both in the same family of trade, you know. I oh, mean, you're both inverted. you're both you're buying the volatility. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're long ball in that regard for sure. Uh, I'm open to both. You know, I like the flies too. I think they're a little bit easier to execute, but uh, I understand trade it, of preference, you know. And, and the debate really goes to probability versus reward to risk, right? Mm -hmm. On the inverted fly, you got a higher probability, but you're limited in how much money you can make on it. Now you are on the Debicon as well, but you have a you have more re return potential on the Debicon than you do on the inverted fly, but you have lesser probability. So higher probability, less return on the fly, lesser probability, slightly higher return on the Debicon. Both of them are good on the, and, and for the pro members out there, guys, go and check that out if you weren't there live. It was it was a real good show, especially that last 40 minutes. And if you're not a pro member, go ahead, go become a pro member. Yeah. I mean, honestly, it was an amazing, uh, amazing culture show last night. You know, uh, some of the other companies on the NASDAQ I want to talk about here, AMTD, Ameritrade, the brokerage houses, Matt, are usually tradable vehicles. I like Schwab and Ameritrade and E-Trade and, uh, e and whatnot. Uh, AMTD is on my watch list. Didn't play this one, uh, but gap down on some weakness on earnings. They've had bearishness in the past. You see the breakdown back there in March was pretty significant when financials were selling. One Always of the few companies that have missed on earnings per share, Tim. Yeah. I, I mean, it's really on TD. It's really as, as, as simple as that. And, uh, you know, TD, uh, Tackle Trade has done a wonderful job in trying to increase your revenue. And I want you to recognize that TD Ameritrade. <laughs> I want you to start talking to me, TD Ameritrade. I got an army of traders That's that right. use your software. You need to start lowering all of our commissions. You know, I need to go to TD and start talking to them about that again. Um, get a little fixed rate for Tackle maybe. But in terms in terms of TDs, guys, I mean, it's just one of the few companies in the last week and a half I've seen miss on earnings per share, Tim. I've mm -hmm. seen misses on guidance. I've seen misses on revenue. But I haven't seen a whole lot of misses on earnings per share. Maybe slight beats come in line. And this was just a slight miss. That That is all it was, was a slight miss on earnings per share. And in a bearish trend, when you're dealing with a little bit of a bearish retracement coming back up into these 54, uh, excuse me, the 54 handle right there, you you need to wow, and I've talked about this. When you're when you see a price go from 49 to 54 in three weeks in front of an earnings report, you're talking about a 10% price movement here, Tim. 
10% price movement coming into an earnings report after an M formation, you better wow on the earnings numbers. And obviously, TD did not uh, did not do that. If you drop this out to a three-year weekly chart, you see this tremendous trend line just pushing TD back down. So obviously, the projections on TD at this point have to be back down into support, minimum 50, but most likely 40, uh, 48 to 49. Yeah, quick look at the uh, RTY, if you would, bring that one up and uh, let's read that chart. Let's see what kind of deep analysis we're going to get on RTY today. Um, nothing to see here. It's stuck in a range until it breaks 1600. If it does break 1600, that's significant. Anything to add, Matt? Nope. All right, move on to FXI. Uh, bring you. up uh, the, the Chinese market. I'll tell you, there is some volatility in China here today. Pulling back into moving averages, you also have a momentum change. I saw some news about trade uh, expectations next week. They're going to resume trade talks next week. I don't know what that means. I mean, they've been doing I don't it here. may not matter, but that this is pulling back here today. More significant of a sell-off internationally than what we're seeing in the U.S. Anything to see here, Matt? Yeah, no, I haven't looked into that news yet, Tim. I mean, every time I see trade talk news, I, I honestly, I, I turn the channel, I click on something else. I, I mean, how many times do we have to rehash the exact same analysis over a four-month time period? Let every, me see a deal. Stop talking about it. Get a deal done. <laughs> That's right. Shut your mouth. Well, don't, Mark don't, had an interesting don't, theory. Don't though, even on tell the- us. Don't even tell us your meeting. Listen. Just get a damn deal done. Mark had a very interesting theory on the Trading Justice podcast that they're going to string that out forever because why would you ever strike a deal? Every time they have positive news about the U.S.-China trade deal, the market goes up and it's a way for them to kind of manipulate. That's fine. And I I agree with that. That's the analysis that's been going on over the last four months. But do you think I'm the only trader that is sick and tired of hearing it? (laughs) At some point, it's going to have a negative response to him. I promise you. You can't cry wolf all the time. No, you, you can't. At some point, there's a point of attrition with this to where you keep saying it, saying it, saying it. And the markets will be like, shut up, shut up and dance. Let's do something. Let's, 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 let's dance. Let's get a deal done. Let's dance. David Bowie, for sure. One of my favorite David Bowie songs and one of the greatest artists of all time. David Bowie, shout out, obviously here. Uh, Matt, uh, David Bowie. Doc, we haven't seen in a long time, though. Grab my attention today. PCG, Pacific Oil and Gas. Now, they had all that stuff in the news recently. But now they've ever so subtly started coming back all the way back up to the gap point. Uh, This used to be a very stable company. Is there any way that you would put this back on a watch list until you get clarity? No. Uh, I don't think so. No. Are you kidding me? They're not out of the woodworks yet. They just reshuffled their entire board of directors and they increased it to like 15 or 16 members. Uh, No, they still have legal culpability. They still have, you know, consumer problems. They still have debt problems. They still have revenue problems. No, no, I mean, not for me. I'll just say that. Yeah, I agree. Yeti, you know, small cap companies as we're rounding out stocks here, just a few last ones. Yeti is one of my favorite companies, one of my favorite brands. Uh, They've done very, very well now pressing into new highs. That whole uh, IPO X date uh, did not stop the stock at all. In fact, it just kept running, Matt. We're pressing into a breakout point here on Yeti. Well, explain what that date you just mentioned was because I'm I'm fairly certain some people don't understand it. Some investors, when they are in pre-IPO, they they cannot sell their shares on the IPO date. You know, so it's not like when the market comes out and starts trading. It's like an expiration almost. And Mark Cuban, or even like when acquisitions or buyouts happen, there's a lot of little contingencies with accredited investors. And uh, that ex-IPO date is when they can actually come out and sell those shares. Mm-hmm. So if a company had been performing poorly or if somebody wanted to lock in profit and you had a huge investment in Yeti and let's say you're up 100% year to date, um, there was- You're some- not up 100%. You're up more than that. You're more up like 130% not. now. So there's a lot of people that might think, well, are they going to take profit on that? Well, let right? me ask you. Let's say you were an insider in Yeti. Yeah. Okay. You went public with uh, with the company. You obviously have made some money. You now are able to lock in some of that after a historic run in the last, you know, four months. Mm-hmm. Would you be tempted to? I would be tempted. For I should, sure. But they didn't. Yeah. What does that tell you? Yeah. It tell, I mean, if you have confidence in your position size correctly, yeah. though, and you're an investor, I mean, it's it's all about emotion. Same thing. If you're an accredited investor and know what you're doing, it's not like you're going to have everything in one company, most likely. It's not like you need the cash, I'm guessing that. Uh, so if it's a strong performer doing well, you know, it's like let your profits run, cut your losses short. Uh, obviously, there was some chatter about it. You know, traders are always trying to find where the risk is. And so that date came out and they're like, okay, is there a risk here? Even I asked the question 
And now here what we are. What did I say? Uh, you said, don't worry about it. If it's an investment, it's an investment. Uh, yep. It was great advice for sure. Stocks, any other stocks on your mind here before we move on to the dollar and commodities, Matt? No, the only thing on my mind is the dollar. Yeah. It, the it, dollar. Took, it took 45 minutes to get to the point where the only thing I cared about. Cody, Actually, I, I cared about other things, but Cody, I do care about the dollar. Cody, what's going on with the dollar? I know you and Matt, uh, you've well, been nailing oh, this thing. Y'all y'all need to start listening to our face. analysis on the dollar. <laughs> I, I'm telling for you, past, telling yeah, for the past what month we've been talking about. All right, if it, if it breaks 97.5, you got to watch for it to break 97.7. Breaks 97.7, look at it. And here it is. We've been waiting for this. And yeah, more in depth it, than this is actually the, the cross pairs. They're all yeah, just breaking the, major supports. The, on the, the, the more in-depth is that Europe is burning down and Germany is dying economically. That's the more in-depth. Uh, German economic reports came out today again, and co business confidence is just dropping. And, and, and Cody, what is it dropping like? Dropping like it's hot. <laughs> dropping like it's hot. It's dropping mm -hmm. like it's hot. And uh, that's going to be in Cody's uh, ear. Like well, huh? Co so I get into the, the pre-production show, and we get in about 10 o'clock our time, about 30 minutes before we go live. And Cody's like, hey, Matt, did you did you see the euro? I'm like, drop it like it's hot. Drop it like it's hot. Drop <laughs> and all of a sudden, me and Cody just start shorting it more. Um, no, I, well, yeah. I added. During yeah, the Cody, show, I've added to the position. I'm shorting yeah. it. It's it, it's German factory or not factory orders, but business confidence uh, declined uh, recessionary territory. Uh, that's on the backs of yesterday's negative news coming out regarding the European banking situation. And so that was obviously a negative. But that's not the only thing that happened on the dollar today, Tim. You had the U.S. dollar ca uh, Canadian cross pair here. Canada, Canada announces interest rates and they maintained interest rates at 1.75 percent. Last was the entire world expected that one. Um, I, I obviously expected it as well. And uh, they followed suit kind of like what we talked about a couple days ago, Tim. They followed suit with what uh, uh, the uh, European banks have done, what the, uh, what the uh, U.S. banks have done in terms of uh, responding to the dovish rhetoric from a, a slowing growth uh, environment. And uh, I fully expect the Bank of Japan to do the exact same thing here tonight. Obviously, you got tremendous momentum behind the currency right now. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how the Japanese, uh, uh, obviously, that, that's going to throw a wrench into this, Tim. But uh, the, uh, the Japanese, uh, and I think it's around, it, it's all tentative with, with Bank of Japan uh, monetary policy. They don't give you an exact moment in time. So if you are in some type of cross pair on long dollar type trades, whether it's against the pound euro, uh, the, the CAD here today, Keep an eye on the Japanese reports that come out tonight. That could certainly impact it both up and it could continue to move the momentum with the, perhaps a break of 98 now, or we could see a little bit of a fade back down and a reason to lock in profit. So keep an eye on the Bank of Japan here tonight. That's the next reporting currency. And when you're trading currency, day trading or swing trading currency, the two most important things you have to understand in the currency market is the banking cycle on a 24-hour perspective and, uh, and, and when economic reports happen, because that's what drives currency valuation. Stocks are driven through a variety of different means. Currencies are driven through economic reports and bank opens. And so keep an eye on, on that next major, major, major economic report coming out of the Bank of Japan later on today. Yeah. You know, obviously dollar moving up, commodities are going to take uh, some reaction to that as well, Matt. Uh, going to crude oil next, uh, red candle hitting a high point, but still very much intact in the trend, very strong. In fact, the resiliency is impressive to me. Dollar so strong, I thought crude might have a little counter relationship here, but uh, actually uh, looking pretty good here. What's your read on the chart? I, I felt for a very long time, crude's decoupled from the dollar. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't have the same, you know, correlation or divergent perspective that it once did and we've seen that decouple over years and years and years now not just over the last few months gold is the one that's a little concerning to me with the dollar going up and gold also going up 5.5 points so we'll talk about gold i'm sure next crude oil big price movement coming in on monday with the breakout of 65 it, it's now <clears throat> it's now playing defense and everybody knows what that means it's now playing defense with the movement it's nothing to see unless it comes back down under 65 
Yeah, uh, gold next, uh, metals market, and obviously gold having a little bit of a bounce back today. What's interesting, and Franco just asked that exact question, Matt. Yeah. Coaches, would you say that historical correlation between CLDXY and GC is no longer happening these days? Dollar up, gold up, Matt. Uh, what is going on here? I, I, I would say, okay, th things short term, like take the Aussie dollar versus the New Zealand dollar, Tim. Those two have like a 93% correlation rate. What that means is 93% of the time, the Aussie dollar goes up, the New Zealand dollar goes up. 93% of the time, the Aussie dollar goes down, the New Zealand dollar goes down. That's correlation. Mm -hmm. And for the longest time, crude oil, gold, and the dollar were what was called divergent. And what that mean was that if the dollar went up, golden oil would go down. And if the dollar went down, golden oil would go up. And that's because the mass majority of gold and oil in the world is priced and settled in one currency, United States dollars. When you buy gold, you buy it in dollars. When you buy oil, you buy it in dollars. If you want to buy Saudi Arabian oil, well, historically, you buy it in dollars. Well, that still happens from a gold perspective, Tim, for the most part, but that does not happen from an oil perspective as much. When you look at, the oil, when you look at just the supply of oil being sold to the world over the course of the last, say, 25 years, in 1999, oil was priced in dollars about 90% of the time. I mean, literally, 90% of oil sold in the world was settled in dollars. That number now is under 50%. And so the, the, over the last 20 years, you've seen a decoupling from the dollar in terms of oil trade. And so now oil and the dollar don't necessarily have to move in line with one another. They're, they're decoupling but gold is not. So to answer Franco's question, I would say I still see uh, divergent behavior within the dollar and, and your precious metal groups and specifically gold, specifically gold, but not necessarily in oil. Look at the last month. Oil's been on a tear. The dollar's been on a tear. Yeah. Yeah. It's been impressive, uh, obviously on oil and the dollar and gold has kind of lagged, but a green day here today is going to be an interesting one to see if it can make some sort of a comeback. Um, it, it's to me, it's really just tr trying its best to reclaim 1280. The yeah. buyers are, the buyers are trying, the bulls are trying, demand is trying, Russia's trying, China's trying, the central bank of the United States is trying, but there's not a lot of fear in the market right now. Mm-hmm. And on a little doji day in the market, gold went up a little bit, but there's just no fear in this market. And that fear will come back at some point. Mm -hmm. And in the halftime report, we'll analyze it when it does. But until that fear subsides, I mean, I just don't see gold as a viable place to put money right now. Yeah, it's uh, been a tough one. I mean, long term, obviously, we always have that disclaimer. And talk there's about a difference ones. between physical metals and uh, analyzing the paper instrument, guys. 100%. And, uh, you know, last thing, and we, we promised our team out there, and by the way, Halftime Crew, it's always great to have you guys here. I love coming in daily and doing the Halftime Report. Uh, if you're here, you're watching, and you have not yet subscribed to our channel, click on subscribe. Click the bell to make sure you know when videos come live and when we uh, get up there and running. Last thing, Matt, we promised our team here today we were going to break down Tesla earnings. And you have a lot of those numbers, and you've done a lot of that prep already. Uh, wh what do we got here? Okay. Once again, when you're, when you're looking at earnings, it, 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 everything is about what the market expects. And I, I said this in the coaches show last night. I'll say it again. When I was a young trader, uh, a, a more veteran trader who I didn't know very well. He wasn't a coach or a mentor. He was just a trader I'd met along the way. And he said to me, I'd, I'd never traded earnings really. And he said, oh, all you got to do is buy a call and buy a put, and, you know, and <laughs> you trade it bi-directionally. I'm like, oh, that's, that's all you got to do? I, I just got to buy a call and I just got to buy a put. And wow, I, I, I can just make money. And I didn't understand volatility crushes. And, but it wasn't necessarily the volatility crush that's concerning. The concerning part is the fact that the market will price in the expected market maker move. And I didn't know anything about that. When you, when you buy a call and when you buy a put in front of earnings, you have to have the market move more than what the market expects. Mm -hmm. If the stock goes up or the stock goes down, that doesn't mean you're going to make money one way or the other. Because of the because of the priced in expected move, because of the volatility crush, you need to have it move about 1.5 times the market maker move. And that that just to be profitable when you buy a call and buy a put and you straddle or strangle the trade in front of earnings. Straddles and strangles should be done four six four to six weeks before earnings. Well, this was before I knew any of that. 
earnings is all about understanding the market pricing in the expected gap. And that is what we call a market maker move. And if you come to the trade tab here on Tesla, you can see the expected market maker move is 17 points. Well, 17 points today to Tesla represents something that might be different than it was when it was priced at say $300 or $350 or $150. 17 points to Tesla when it's priced at 261 represents a 6.7% expected gap move. So everything starts with understanding how much the market expects Tesla to move because look at what the volatility is doing here. In the two day options, we only have two days left in the trading day, tomorrow and Friday, it's pricing in a 20 point movement here Tomorrow, it's pricing in a 17 price uh, price movement here. So you can kind of see how it is pricing in that, that massive expected movement because it's expecting a 17-point movement tomorrow, Tim, and a total of a 20-point movement throughout Friday. So that 17 points is projected to be price movement tomorrow, not through the week. It expects 17 points tomorrow and an additional three points on, on Friday. So what we're expecting is a tremendous amount of movement on the earnings gap is what you're seeing there. Once again, it represents 6.7%. After you understand the market maker move and kind of relative to the price percentage movement that the market can move, you then have to come back to the chart and you analyze these gap ranges on this earnings on this earnings, on this earnings, and on this earnings. And I like to get about four. I like to get about four because that represents an entire fiscal year mm -hmm. of earnings moves. Well, working right to left here, in the first earnings gap, it, gap, uh, it gapped nine points, which represents a 3% price movement. In the second gap, Tim, it gapped six points, which represents a 2% price movement. In the third one, it gapped 27 points, which represents an 8.6% price movement. And the fourth one, it gapped 23 points, which represents a 7.3% price movement. The average gap is 18.75 points, with the average gap range based on the gap, uh, the, close, uh, the closing price of the day before the gap was 5.2% price movement. What you're seeing here is a slight edge to them overpricing Tesla's volatility. Is, is what I mean. So when you have an average gap range at 6.7% versus the, uh, excuse me, the market maker uh, gap range at 6.7% versus the average gap uh, range at 5.2%, that does give you a slight edge. I want to say you got the edge the same way you have Facebook when we were breaking that down in the, in the coaches show last night, but you do have a slight edge to them pricing in too much volatility into these short-term options here, and if you and and if you and if your analysis is it's pricing in too much volatility, based on what you see historically in the chart, what would that lead you to the conclusion, Tim? How would you approach that? Well, if they're pricing, if they're overpricing volatility, then you could sell the volatility, right? You know, if they're underpricing volatility, then you can buy the volatility. Uh, I actually, when I was running the numbers here today, Matt, I found uh, that there was an edge in the short term with the bi-directional, but I think there's also an edge in the long term by selling. You know, I, I looked at the July options, Matt, uh, or even the June options at 58 days, and I'm, it, it's a really interesting earnings for me because there's so much focus. Look at the implied volatility numbers on the right. 110%, but the market maker projection at 17, you went through all the numbers and Tesla, even just instinctively, forget the data for, for, for five seconds. Yeah. This company's crazy and everybody has an opinion. We've seen wild volatility and I do think you're going to catch a move, but do I think you're going to get a 150 point gap? I don't. And I'm telling you right now, there's money at a hundred dollar gap ranges up and down in July. You know, I looked at the numbers, Matt, uh, the 160, 360 short strangle, or even an iron condor you could probably do. There's good ROI out there, right? And so it comes down to preference and style, whether you want to sell the longer term volatility. I don't sell short strangles short term, by the way. Oh, no. uh, you, you know, I go longer term with them. 75 days is my sweet spot. It's my favorite way to do it. This is a big boy trade. All trades are big boy trades. If you don't then, have uh, this, this is a big boy trade. There's no doubt about it. But Matt, look at the 360, 160 credit. 571 on 2,600 bucks means 20% and the deltas are like five and 10, right? And you've got, I you went through all the gap numbers. Did we see any 75 point gaps? No. No, we didn't. No, I mean, it's, it's one of those ones that, 
I hate to say it, but it's one of those ones that everybody expects Tesla to move so much, but it never does. And they expect it to move that much just because it's Tesla. Yeah. I mean, yeah. seriously. If it wasn't Tesla, but it is Tesla. So you can't say that. But you if can't. it was Tesla, but if it wasn't Tesla, if it wasn't right. Tesla, you do the trade. But it is Tesla, and you have to take that into account because Elon's a risk in earnings, Tim. He is. Remember when he last year about this time, he started barking at the analyst in middle of the earnings uh, conference call. The stock started getting crushed. You know, but then we ha- we've ha- we've seen it where it gaps out and comes back, and then we've seen light gaps, and we it's a fun one on earnings. I think there's a lot of different ways you can play this, Matt. I like the short term inverted fly, you know, because you can kind of find a way to get break even points that work. Uh, this is a I, risk graph trade. It is a risk graph trade, but um, you got massive range there. The only question I have is. Can you do the same thing, take more advantage of the volatility in June versus July? And you just have to prep those. Maybe. And the you're other not going to get the range, but maybe even you go, maybe even go match deltas, go five deltas on, on both sides of the equation. But the analysis is, is still the same. I mean, the market expects more than what Tesla typically does. Correct. And, and I'll tell you, um, the, the reality is selling volatility short is a naked option, you know, and condors, you don't get the same Vega mat. Uh, but for a lot of traders on a stock this size, doing a condor on the 60 day, where even if it was like a 25 point window on the condor, you would reduce the, the risk of some catastrophic well, craziness. So let's, let's start with the 10 delta on the 58 day contract here. That's okay. the 190. Yeah. Let's sell that condor here. And you do mitigate the volatility, but you cover the risk. And that's why I kind of like it. Are we going to bring up the old right click, left click debate here at some point? No, we're not. <laughs> Y'all are wrong. <laughs> and then uh, 345. So you can get 345. You don't get the 360, but you can get the 345. But 70 points is four market maker moves, Matt. Even to 190, you got tons of cushion. Just with short strangle, I went to July and further because to me, I need a bigger window, right? Uh, I, I, it just is Tesla. But even here, there's credit at a four or five market maker move on a Condor. It's, uh, oh my gosh. Look at the yeah. 10 point. I'm saying 10 point window. 137 bucks on 863 is about a 15% ROI. Fill out your tackle theta research spreadsheet. Somebody in the chat, just type in tackle theta research spreadsheet for me so that we're all clear. You don't have to do these numbers in your head. Make sure you run them in the spreadsheet. But Matt, those numbers are pretty impressive for a 10 Delta. And uh, with that much cushion and distance, I actually think there might be the edge there uh, as I look through Tesla. Well, I, and, and again, I mean, the, the analysis leads to a short strangle, but Again, I just can't. I I just don't trust Elon. I haven't pulled the trigger for a reason, Matt. Yeah. I have not personally pulled the trigger on this one. I built it all. I did all the work. I run the numbers. I trade Tesla all the time uh, for earnings. You know, it's one of my favorite earning stocks. But man, can you go short strangle on Elon Musk? I don't know. <laughs> I, I might skip it. Oh, I, so I, I'm going to have to like walk around the block and meditate on this one. It fits all my rules. So if I didn't have. <clears throat> He said the other day, if we don't buy a Tesla, we're making the dumbest financial decision because it would be like dry, uh, riding a horse in three years. It, yeah, it, but every first of all, I did buy an electric car, Elon Musk. I bought it from Toyota, all right? And, <laughs> and I got a nice little hybrid from Toyota I'll, as well. I'll tell you as well. The other thing is Ford just announced that they have some investment into an electric truck making company. See, the problem is they're all doing the business model is that you don't have exclusive rights on electric vehicles. And uh, your branding, and you just simply have not turned your EPS numbers positive enough. All right, I'm gonna year over year is good, Matt. But I agree, ran over. Um, let's ask, let's ask the uh, the crew. Short strangle or iron condor to cover the risk to Elon. Short strangle or iron condor. Which one? Which one leads to the, the better analysis? What do you guys think? Short strangle. 80, what was that? An 86 day contract, hundred point ranges, mm-hmm. getting about 500 versus 2,300 on the margin per contract or iron condor 58 day contract. You're getting about 15% return, but you're covering your risk. 
paper trade it. If you're Jim, new, you know damn well I have a truck. <laughs> and I'm going to go get in my nice little Chevy here after this. And I'm going to just go <laughs> crank in me some, uh, some uh, what should I listen to? I'm going to crank in some Tom Petty. And I'm just going to drive around to feel like a man, Jim. <laughs> Oh, when the Texans start calling us out for my electric car, my uh, <laughs> first of all, Jim, my my Toyota, it it runs like just you know a cat purring. It's a beautiful thing. First of all, it's your wife's Toyota. It's true. It's and, yeah. and, and and the other one is my wife's Toyota. They have, and literally they have the exact same car. Um, I think the IC wins here. I think ACDC. I'll I'll do some ACDC, Jim. Yeah. I'll do some back in black. I'll feel good. That was my high school song, Jim. Um, I, I think the Iron Condor to cover the risk. Yeah. I think the Iron Condor to cover the risk. But you never know. And that's, that's, what, that's what earnings is. And, guys, what I would recommend for those of you who have never done earnings is I would recommend virtual trade. Go for practice sure. these. And, guys, I'm, I'm, I, I cannot say this more. You should not trade live earnings announcements. And especially on companies like Facebook and Tesla and these high flyers, unless you have practiced at least 30 to 50 times. Well, and I'll make it simple. I won't drop big fancy trading terms like equity curve and drawdowns and all that. If you don't know that it's a profitable system for you based on your practice, then you're not ready to do it live. You have to know that. And until you know that it's paper trade until then. Right. I mean, that's the way that it works. Um, Awesome. I, I love earnings season. <laughs> Everybody complains about it because there's no trades. There's a million trades. A million I, trades. If you know I've got Vega it. trades. I've got day trades. I've got theta trades. I've got all kinds of stuff. The only thing not working for me right now is dumb GE. It won't turn over. Uh, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's end. Let's end on GE going up. There we go. It just. Hey, it doesn't want to break nine. It doesn't. It did break it for a day and, you know, yeah. and then it came back and stopped people out. Now it's sitting on a bare retracement, but you got earnings now in a little bit. Uh, say la vie. There's bingo, Ilka. There's bingo. Who Guys, got bingo? I don't know who got it. We got to get that bingo. I don't know if we did bingo. I don't know if we, anybody got bingo today. Programming I, note. I, 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 did, I didn't hear, a, I didn't hear a Chase the Dragon. Oh, by the way. <clears throat> I didn't hear a say la vie. Take precedence over everything. Frank Martin, who does the market recap, recap gang. Uh, you know Frank very well. It's his birthday today, guys. Happy I, birthday, Frankie. Frank, give, happy birthday, man. Give Frank a big shout out in the chat. Happy birthday, yeah, Frank. Everybody happy birthday to Frankie. Yeah. Frank does an absolute wonderful job for tackle trading. He does the onboarding for all of you guys. He does the half to, the the market recap uh, video after every day. He's just he's he's one of he's one of our coaches and he's one of our uh, amazing amazing team members. So happy birthday, Frankie! No doubt about that. Give him a shout out on Twitter if you're on Twitter at hashtag Team da- Tackle. Ha- happy birthday, Frank Martin. Yeah, I'm sure he's gonna hate me for that, but I don't. Jim, care and by the way. Day. He was Frank the Tank in college. I'm going to tell you <laughs> right now. He hit me in the face the first time I met him with a 25, you know, plastic bag of laundry detergent, and I knew he was one of my best friends for life at that moment. <laughs> oh my! Well, fun show, Matt. Fun uh, show, guys. Love the analysis. Great job. Uh, hashtag Team Tackle. By the way, if you're watching this, uh, make sure programming note tonight for you bear market survival guide traders. It's an 8 p.m. Eastern start, not 8.30 p.m. Eastern. I confirmed that with Coach Tyler and Coach Mark before the show. 8 p.m. Eastern tonight. Uh, Make sure that you attend that mastermind group. It's a a once-a-month group. And go and uh, check that out. Matt, any last words here? No, real fun fun show today. Looking forward to being here again tomorrow. Yep, sounds good. All right, guys, uh, we'll see you guys tomorrow. Halftime crew, get in the game. Cody, good job, kid.